very good evening to all of you on behalf of sri lanka medical association i welcome everyone for this regional meeting between the sri lanka medical association and candy society of medicine in a way this meeting is a historic meeting because this is the first time that a slma regional meeting is happened uh, in our online complete virtual format initially we were about to have this uh, regional conference in a face to face physical meeting however due to current circumstances we had to convert this into a virtual mode so in a way it is historic and we are facing the challenge of the current situation but still going ahead with our activities so i would like to thank dr dushant madagidhar and the candy society of medicine also for the addition to go ahead with this meeting and uh, today our discussion will be basically focused on mental health uh, that is to commemorate the world mental health day and the uh, Reports related to that. So most of our, all of our speakers will be speaking about different aspects related to mental health. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Dushant Madhagidhara, the president of the Kandy Society of Medicine, to welcome all of you on behalf of KSN. Over to you, Dr. Madhagidhara. Yeah. yeah. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Indika Karunalakne, President of Sri Lanka Medical Association. On behalf of the Kandy Society of Medicine. It is my privilege and honor to welcome all of you, the all experts in this today webinar, as well as all our participants for this very important webinar on mind and health, which we are doing with jointly, as, as uh, the Professor Garuna Ratna explained to you, by the Kennedy Society of Medicine, as well as the Silica Medical Association. We have four experts, uh, and they are talking on the different aspects of uh, Uh, disorder related to the the mental health, and we hope this webinar will going to enlighten you and educate you and upgrade your knowledge and to improve your sense of a, of a, this type of medical problem, which will be definitely facilitating all of us to our day to day management. So we have these four speakers; they are expert on these areas. And after the end of their presentation, all four, we will have a question and answer time. Session where you can direct it to your question on this chat one, and then we will be directed to the respective speakers, and uh, and this uh, and uh, and traditionally we are in, uh, introducing our speakers by the two of us. Now the first uh, lecture is uh, 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 it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Tilini Rajapaksa. She is a professor in psychiatry department of psychiatry. And the faculty of is it the faculty of medicine, University of Pera, Dania. Tilini uh, obtained her MD medicine from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Colombo, University of Colombo, and the PhD in the National University of uh, Australia, from Australia. And she is attached to the department and has her research interests on many and out of which the most important she has a research interests on suicide in Sri Lanka, depression, and the self poisoning. and she is going to talk to us on suicide and self harm in sri lanka can it be prevented yes, now i invite tilini to present her uh, presentation tilini to you thank you sir thank you for this uh, opportunity and for that kind introduction i will start by um, sharing my slides if that's okay so This is my topic for the next ten or fifteen minutes: suicide and self harm in Sri Lanka. And before we go to whether it can be prevented, I thought we would start. I would start with giving a little background about suicide in Sri Lanka. And this slide shows you uh, how the rates of suicide have changed in Sri Lanka over the past decades. And as you can see, we used to have a relatively low rate of suicide but in the mid 970s going up to the mid 90s we saw a rapid increase in suicide rates in sri lanka to a peak in 1995 in 95 we had the second highest rate of suicide in the world of 47 per 100000 and most of this was young men dying due to ingestion of very toxic pesticides and this obviously at that time led to a lot of concern and one important measure taken at that time by the government at a national level 
was restriction of access to pesticides, which is really in terms of suicide prevention, it's about restricting the method of suicide. And did this work for Sri Lanka? Well, as you can see, after 95, our rates of completed suicides have gradually fallen. And this is in large part due to the restriction of access to pesticides. And this graph will show you how the various methods of suicides have changed in Sri Lanka over the past decades. So if you look at this red line, that's pesticide poisoning. It has fallen dramatically. This shows you the, the numbers dying by hanging. And as you can see, there's a slight increase. This sometimes happens when you stop one method, you get a method substitution, but the increasing in hanging rates have certainly not you know, gone up to the pesticide suicide rates. So overall, this has been a success story in that sense, but still Sri Lanka has at the moment about a suicide rate of about 14 per 100,000. And now our most common method of suicide is by hanging. No, no longer pesticides, but that is still the second common method. And when it comes to suicide, in Sri Lanka at present, it's more male suicides in keeping with the rest of the world. The rates increase with age and for completed suicides, there is a significant association with psychiatric morbidity, particularly depression and alcohol use disorders. This slide shows you something slightly different. This is not completed suicide rates. These are rates of hospital admissions of people who have got, you know, who have taken a poison or a pesticide or an overdose, they have not died. They have been brought to hospital for treatment and survived. And as you can see, since 95, our rates of hospital admissions for attempted self-poisoning seem to be going up. And this is happening all over the country, urban, rural, and the most common method of self-poisoning attempted at the moment is medicinal overdoses. And this is based on some work we did at Peradeniya Hospital over about a period of a year. We looked at who gets admitted for self-poisoning to Peradeniya to the toxicology unit. And what we realized is a majority come due to medicinal overdoses, most commonly paracetamol. But pesticide poisoning is still there. And um, in, I've also noted, we have data that in areas like Anuradhapur and Pulunnaru, pesticide day poisoning is still fairly common. And when it comes to attempted self-poisoning, it's more common among young people. You'll see here 80% below 35 years. So when I say uh, old here, I'm referring to over 35. And it's more females who attempt, though you'll remember when it comes to completed suicides, it's more males. And this is very much in keeping with Western patterns. So this is what's happening in the country at the moment. And when you look at who takes what, with regards to attempted self-poisoning, young people tend to take a lot more medicational overdoses and they tend to be more female. Older people, over 35, take both medicinal overdoses and pesticides, and they tend to take more pesticides, which is of more high lethality, and they tend to be more mad. The next thing that we did question is, why do people do this? Why does somebody take an overdose or ingest pesticide and attempt to harm themselves like this? So we conducted interviews with um, people who had self-poisoned, survived, and been treated at the hospital. And we can tell it was a series of qualitative interviews because of time. I'll just give you one excerpt. This was a 15 year old school girl who had taken, you know, her grandmother's pressure tablets. Um, so what her, what she said was she had gone to school. Her class teacher had punished her in public in front of the other school children because he saw, he had found a letter from her boyfriend. So. She just found that this 15 year old girl had a boyfriend and the class teacher punished her in public. And she said she felt very ashamed, humiliated in front of the others. And when she was going home, she, was, she didn't know what to do. She was very frightened because the implications was that she, was, she would be expelled from school. She couldn't tell her parents this because it's not something you can tell your parents. And she was stuck. 
And then she went home extremely distressed, saw her grandmother's tablets and took an overdose. And this is just one example in many that we see. And what we often see across the board in old and young people is that the self-poisoning attempt often follows some kind of an interpersonal conflict. It's often with a close family member or friend. And in that moment, the person has extreme diff difficulty tolerating this distress. And they might have a mixture of motives, depending who, on who they are and where they're coming from. It might be a mixture of anger, shame, guilt. There may be a variable intent to die, but there's often an intent to escape unbearable pain. And also, Often people have heard about this, you know, overdosing, taking some pesticides. They know of somebody else who's done it. They've seen it on TV. So it's also somewhat of a familiar concept. And then this happens. So you might ask, what about psychiatric illness? Do people who attempt suicide have psychiatric illness? Well, the answer is not everybody. In fact, sorry, that went too fast, but um, when we look at all this, also says the same thing. When we look at our group of people who attempt self-poisoning, you will see a larger group of young females, and many of them will not have a psychiatric illness. But within that group, we get a smaller group of older people over 35 years who tend to have a higher risk of psychiatric illness, particularly depression and alcohol. They might be more likely to take pesticides, and they might be more likely to be males, and they they are at higher risk of repetition, but a majority would be young and have a less psychiatric morbidity. And across the board, it's often an acute conflict or acute stressor that triggers this. And there's a lot of distress associated with the attempt. The other issues in the background in Sri Lanka haven't formally been assessed, but they're very likely to contribute, particularly socioeconomic challenges, gender conflict, alcohol use, and domestic violence, which we sometimes see so often, but are, tend to take for granted. So then, if this is the situation in Sri Lanka, can we do anything to prevent this? Can suicide and self-harm be minimized or even stopped? Well, wherever you go in the world, it is a very challenging, um, challenging problem. And evidence from all over the world suggests there's no one magic solution. Uh, recommendations are look at the problem, look at the evidence-based strategies that are available that have been used in Sri Lanka previously or in the world, and have a multifaceted, that means you, you take multiple approaches do them parallel, integrated, and then of course, so have an ongoing system of monitoring to see are you implementing this and what effect is it having? So if you look at prevention also, you know it can be population level primary where you're putting in a, a change before anything ever happens, as well as secondary prevention for people who have attempted self-harm already to prevent repetition. And the most important, one of the most important primary population measures that Sri Lanka has already implemented is this restriction of availability of methods, particularly availability of very toxic pesticides. And this needs to be ongoing because pesticide poisoning is our second common method of suicide still. And we also see self-poisoning, attempted self-poisoning with pesticides. Moving on, the next step, but we need to move on beyond this and Another important area is educating just doctors about you know, identifying risk factors, depression, how to, risk, how to identify, manage, refer when needed, and also increasing mental health awareness in the community. And I think towards educating primary care doctors, one of the most important things we are doing at present is having psychiatry as a final year subject in all medical schools in the country. Our medical students today will be our doctors tomorrow who will be then doing this service through the country. If we are increasing awareness, we also need to improve psychiatric services in the country. And that's a work in progress. Now every district in the country has a mental health unit, at least a clinic. Many districts have units. 
this needs to be you know continued and further developed there are many also other factors contributing to suicide and self harm which go beyond the purview of health which include factors such as social economic issues gender conflict domestic violence and these are also factors that actually need to be addressed and particularly substance alcohol use disorders so i mentioned that now the the um, the prevention methods that we have looked at so far are focused on psychiatric morbidity but we mentioned that many people many particularly young people do not have psychiatric illness although they resort to self harm by attempted self poisoning so can we do anything in that regard is it possible to develop skills in you know problem solving coping skills can people learn how to deal with problems if people can learn at what age do we start teaching those how do we teach where well, these are the challenges that actually should be the work of future research in this country and so one suggestion has been to address this as in schools life skill training for example for teenagers and young people which sounds very good in theory but given our school setup with lots of students and extreme focus on exam subjects it's a challenge to implement this sort of programs and the danger might be that it might just become another thing that people memorize for the exam which would not work and i also think it's important to work with teachers and parents because this is just not the fault of young people in fact it's as i gave in my example it's just, it's it's a it's almost like a generation gap that happens and conflict happens between particularly between teenagers and parents which results in this kind of behaviors i put this in because um, while we are teaching young people strategies to deal with problems without self poisoning we should be very careful not to glamorize self poisoning so you don't we do not go in and tell students in a school if you have a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend don't take poison that's bad because then they are thinking if i have a problem that's an interesting thing i can do so if we are doing programs like this we do not need to mention self harm at all it's more a focus on dealing with interpersonal issues problems that kind of approach this i also need to mention media reporting is also a very important part of prevention of suicide and self harm if media glamorizes a suicide what is well known is you can get an increase of copycat suicides in the subsequent weeks and months and remember it's not just newspapers think about social media tv teledramas i mean the next time you watch teledramas think watch out for when the glamorous heroine takes an overdose are we teaching our young people this is the way to respond because that is inadvertent glamorization secondary prevention is the focus on identifying and helping those who have already self harmed treating psychiatric illness and support as needed so to conclude suicide and self harm is a significant public health problem which needs to be an ongoing focus in sri lanka what we do recommend and what is recommended and what i would suggest is a national level coordinated program so rather than isolated programs a national level coordinated program we have so many other coordinated programs dengue prevention program for example perhaps this too needs a national level program based on the best available evidence you develop your strategies and then have a surveillance as to how it is getting implemented and also what effect it has and i must conclude by mentioning this that the, the sri lanka medical association has started or established the expert committee for suicide prevention about a year ago under the patronage of professor samutra katre arachi and the committee has put out a policy document a guideline for suicide prevention in sri lanka which is now available on the slma website and with that mention i will conclude my talk thank you i will stop screen sharing thank you for that very enlightening session and shedding light on a very important topic and we'll take questions once all the presentations are over next i would like to invite our next presenter that's dr chaturi suravira chaturi is a senior lecturer 
in psychiatry from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. She works as a consultant psychiatrist as well, and uh, also a convener in the Mental Health Committee or the Expert Committee of Sri Lanka Medical Association. And she would be talking about a very timely topic that's about novel psychoactive substances and the challenge for joyful living. Over to you, Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening to you all. I hope everybody can hear me. Clear. Right. So uh, my topic for today is a challenge for joyful living, novel psychoactive substances. Now we have various ways that we have opted for to make our life joyful. And some people go for adaptive methods like, you know, uh, sports, music, art, things like that. Whereas some in pursuit of their joy, they resort to maladaptive things like psychoactive substances. Uh, then let's see how does this novel psychoactive substances or psychoactive substances may change their lives from joyful living to a challenging living. Uh, psychoactive substances are chemicals when taken in or added, administered into one system, which have an impact on the mental processes or the effect. It does necessarily not have to be dependence producing because just one of consuming of psychoactive substances can lead to intoxication and various changes in the psychological uh, phenomena. And although a certain compound may have predictable effects, what one must understand that a large psychological component is there, which changes the perception of the or the experience of the uh, user. And additionally, what is more important is, although it looks like it's a psychological thing, there are many physical effects as well of psychoactive substances. So there are many terminology which is being used like addiction, which is being described as a brain disease, which is manifested by compulsive substance use. Then in DSM-4, there is this misuse concept where failure to uh, fulfill major role obligations, physical hazards, legal problems, social problems are included as one of the criterions, which is misuse. And then in ICD-10, there is harmful use, a separate diagnosis where the pattern of psychoactive substance use that is causing damage to health may be physical or mental. Although there could be social consequences, it is not necessary to diagnose harmful use. Then comes to what we are very familiar of, the dependent syndrome. That is what we know of, but underlying, that is just the tip of the iceberg. So I, uh, in dependent syndrome, ICD, in the ICD-10, there are six criteria out of which three are uh, uh, okay to diagnose dependent syndrome. And in DSM-5, there is this entity called substance use disorders. So at least two of the following, which I have mentioned here is adequate to diagnose a substance use disorder. Uh, the common psychoactive substances that we have all come across and that we do all come across routinely is alcohol, benzodiazepine, cannabis, nicotine, which I have mentioned here. So we know what happens with those. I mean, they're familiar up to an extent, but my talk is going to be mainly focused on the novel psychoactive substances and also a bit about amphetamine, the cocaines, which we are seeing commonly now. So apart from those that I mentioned, there are the opiates, the codeine, methadone, diamorphine, which is commonly known as heroin and morphine, the stimulants, amphetamines, MDMA, methamphetamines, cocaine, and hallucinogens, PCB, LSD. These are the ones that we commonly come across. And mind the, um, I have mentioned here, uh, the half-lives. Like for example, morphine, it's 48 hours. Dimorphine, six hours. I have mentioned them for a reason. I'll be talking about it later on. Right, so just looking at the trends, before the 2000, as I said, it's alcohol, opiates, cannabis, and nicotine. But then by the time we came to 2000, 
what was there initially in the West has come to Sri Lanka as well. So we started seeing patients with uh, uh, amphetamines, MDMA, LSD, methamphetamines, and so on. And then now coming to 2020, we have the novel psychoactive substances coming to Sri Lanka as well. So Sri Lanka is no difference. It's just a matter of what time we are experiencing that particular problem. Right, so what are some psychoactive substances which are novel? I will be using the term NPS. NPSs are compounds designed to mimic existing established recreational drugs. They've been created to mimic the existing structure. And by definition, it's substance of abuse, either in a pure form or a preparation that are not listed under the existing conventions. So they can't monitor. It's difficult to monitor these. And also, uh, I would tell you why it's difficult to monitor later on. It's a global phenomenon. Now about 120 countries reporting NPSs, majority are stimulants followed by synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists and hallucinogens and synthetic opiates. By December 2019, more than 950 substances were reported and they are being manufactured at a rate of one per week, one per week. And by the time it comes to the market and going into the uh, uh, monitoring systems, another several have come into the market. So that's why monitoring is very, very difficult with regards to NPSs. And they are sold via internet, smart shops, head shops, and street level drug traffickers, even in Sri Lanka. If you Google, you can find where you can find those drugs in Sri Lanka as well. So it is available. It's not, it's hidden, but then it's available. The challenge is there for us. So just to give an example as to what these NPSs are, now here I am showing you the molecule of amphetamines. So there is the CH3 group and there's the NH2 group. What I have marked from the red line is the additional uh, group which has been added when the NPS was developed. So there's a change here and there's a change here as well, NH and CH3. So they have have maintained the existing structure, but they have made slight changes. So the properties which are there in the existing chemical is there, plus more effects are there. And also it's not listed as a psychoactive substance when it first comes to the market. So that's the challenge. And we are finding it difficult. The researchers are finding it difficult to uh, sort of figure out what effects these additional uh, compounds are giving it. That's why the actions, the, how the patient is feeling is going to be very, very difficult to assess. It might be a huge difference. There might be a huge difference in the effects that the person is feeling. So if we take tetrahydrocannabinol, the active components of cannabis, they have done, what they have done is add this OH, replace it rather, and there's a change here. So that's how they have made HU210, which is the very commonest form of uh, synthetic um, cannabinoid available. So that's how they make it. And it's not that difficult. That's why it's prevalent now. So when considering the global status, most commonly found ones are the stimulants, that is the amphetamine-related ones, and then the synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist. And globally in the world, Sri Lanka falls into the blue section, where it says there are about one to 10 NPSs reported so far in Sri Lanka. And coming to the Sri Lankan context, mind you, these are only about drug arrests, and this is for all substances. So it is commonly seen in the Western province, Southern province and North Western provinces. And clinically, we see a majority of patients coming from these areas as well. Perhaps because of the tourism and the, and the way of living, the uh, clubs and everything. So we see these patients coming in from these areas more. And when we take the figures for 2019, 
not uh, not only the cannabis heroin uh, which are the ones conventional ones which are seeing which we are seeing methamphetamine is reported and you have heard like you know there are news reports of methamphetamine being found and amphetamine being found cocaine being found so it's freely available now and cocaine is also there and now the psychotropic substances which mostly consist of npss are available so when we're talking about NPSs, I would be discussing about the uh, main categories as well. These are the four main categories, the stimulant NPSs, which are structurally related to MDMA, amphetamines, and cocaine. The cannabinoids, which are widely used, uh, which is it's established as a recreational drug, which has uh, created a controversy in Sri Lanka. And hallucinogen NPSs, there are two subcategories, the dissociatives and the psychedelics, uh, with the dissociatives being the harmful, having most of the side, uh, harmful side effects, and the depressants NBSs, which is the benzodiazepines and the opiates. So moving on to uh, stimulants, uh, in, up until about 2000, cocaine, uh, uh, coca leaf, these are the ones that we came across. But by the time we come to 2020, by about 2000, there was cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamines. Now the NPS has been added to it. Usually, amphetamines uh, creates a sense of euphoria, over talkativeness, basically a manic like picture where you feel very happy and enjoyable. And there are the sympathomimetic actions, uh, uh, so activation of the sympathetic system. And in large doses, the detrimental effects, the arrhythmias, hypertension, cerebrovascular accidents. So those are the physical effects which can happen even with just one off use. And the neurological conditions, confusion, seizures, delirium, um, encephalitis, particularly toxic type, and the long-term side effects are going to be there. So those are the effects of amphetamines. And these are the amphetamines that you come across even available in Sri Lanka. So when it comes to stimulants, NPSs, usually it involves serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline, just like in the amphetamines. And uh, what is more important is what is the content. So the dopamine activation is going to lead to a manic-like picture, whereas if there are more serotonin-like uh, uh, effects, then it's going to create uh, empathy, more emotional openness, and so on. So basically, the features are similar to amphetamines per se. A little bit about synthetic cathinones, because this is the important uh, stimulant uh, uh, NPS that we see. So methylone and the mephrodone are the ones which are commonly available, some of which have been found in Sri Lanka as well. Moving on to cannabinoids, which is a very much talked uh, topic. Uh, nine tetrahydrocannabidol is the uh, active form which, crea which uh, creates psychotic symptoms, negative symptoms, and the mood symptoms. Whereas cannabidiol uh, is the one which is assumed to have antipsychotic effects and which is said to have some medicinal effects. So the proportion of these two is going to make the um, net effect, whether a patient is going to be psychotic or not. So what happens, what has happened yeah, to the yeah. cannabinoids? Mm -hmm. Now it's earlier, up until 2000, it was cannabis, uh, cannabis oil, the resin, but now we see the uh, cannabis oil, the existing forms as well, but uh, substances like Kush, which is a hybrid variety, variety and is very, very potent. And the special factor about cannabinoid NPSs is that tetrahydrocannabinol is a partial agonist, whereas SCRAs are typically full agonists. And also, this does not have the, uh, this only contains tetrahydrocannabinol. It does not have the less harmful one. So that is very, very important that we no take note of. So these are the cannabis forms which are available, again, even in Sri Lanka. 
uh, which comes in like a typical feature with NPSs are that it it, ha it is like uh, it comes in very attractive packages like this. Moving on to hallucinogens from the psilocybin mushroom. Now we have moved to ketamine, MDMA, pentacyclidine. So that's the current status of things. And the psychological effects are uh, emotional closeness to others, positive mood, feelings of euphoria, then sensations of newly discovered insight, highly high, heightened perceptions with uh, symptoms similar to physical effects of amphetamines when it comes to the physical symptoms. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, dissociatives are the ones which are having most harmful uh, uh, effects. And apart from that, as I said, physical symptoms are there, which we have to take note of. So these are some of the uh, hallucinogens that we have to see. These are the sort of um, which are used in filter paper and uh, various varieties are available. The depressants, which I'm not going to talk about much because we are familiar with it, because there are two types again, benzodiazepines and the opiates. Uh, so there are the uh, varieties like diclozepam and fubrozepam. And when it comes to uh, opiates, it's the euphoria that the people are going after. Because these NPSs are very pure at times, because uh, then the, the take home message is when we give naloxone in toxicity, we might need to give higher doses when managing these patients. So opiates, there is a dramatic difference because like initially quite few number, quite a few number, morphine, pethidine, but now all these substances are there. And like new substances like carfentanil, 10, 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So these are the ones which we are also familiar with. There are the semi-synthetic and the synthetic uh, varieties and the abuse of which we see. Uh, so there is the fentanyl, uh, uh, oxycodone, some of the examples. So in the clinical settings, why are we talking about this? Do we see patients with these issues like amphetamines, cocaine of, uh, abuse, and uh, novel psychoactive substances? Yes. And the numbers are increasing. And because of the rate of manufacture, new substances are coming into market, and our surveillance systems are not that developed to find out what the constituents are, because even the Western world is struggling. So that is a problem, and we are seeing patients. And there is a change in the way they're presenting from alcohol, cannabis, nicotine. Now it's alcohol, cannabis, nicotine, plus these problems. And which areas do they come from? Don't think it's only from Colombo, although I mentioned that it's Western, uh, Southern areas. There are people coming from all the other areas, rural areas as well. Perhaps because I'm working at National Hospital of Sri Lanka, we get the patients who have been transferred from all over the place. But then patients with toxic, toxic encephalitis, cardiovascular shock, these are some of the presentations that we have come across. And how do they present? With these substances, we have to keep in mind that dependence is not going to be much of a problem because usually the people are not dependent. They would be coming in with problems of acute overdose or physical effects of uh, these substances. So that we need to keep in mind like cardiovascular collapse and so on. And also they might present to you with comorbid use of other major substances like alcohol, uh, opiates or nicotine. And how do we manage? I'm not going to go into details of manage, but a high degree of suspicion is very, very important. Which brings me to the initial site, uh, slide of um, half-lives because, because we don't think of these patients when they come with cardiovascular collapse, like let's say young patients, and when they come with encephalitis like features, by the time we think of these substances, whether it's a toxic encephalitis, then the half-lives have long passed. So then we can't really 
establish the diagnosis. So you have to have a high degree of suspicion. Why is this young person coming in with these symptoms? And do timely urine analysis to overcome this problem because we might actually be missing a certain percentage of uh, patients here. And further research, although there is a good database available in the Dangerous Drug Control Board, uh, we need further research and we need reporting to actually monitor uh, as to what is actually happening. Because for example, these people use the same name to various chemicals. Like if I take the example of apple, some people use it for tramadol, which is the common term, whereas this, another substance may be named apple too. So then there are issues about diagnosis and planning and so on. So future research is very much needed. And the key messages to end my talk is that we have to be highly vigilant about psychoactive substances, particularly the newer ones and also the amphetamines, cocaine and so on. The trends are changing. It's not alcohol, morphine, um, opiates anymore. We, are, we should be available to manage these patients also. And these patients most of the time present with psychological and physical presentations with or without dependence, but most of the time without dependence. And they present with all sorts of symptoms like physical symptoms, which we need to keep in mind as doctors. And anybody is prone, have a very high level of suspicion. And this uh, message goes not only to our patients, but to our families as well our kids, adolescents, have a high level of suspicion as to what toffees they are using because I so showed you the mess, the, fo uh, the photographs, they are very attractive and they would think that this is just a toffee. So thank you very much for the organizing committee to gi for giving this opportunity. Thanks. Chaturi, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation, updating on our psychoactive substances is updating all of us as doctors and the different specialties, but this knowledge is mandatory when we are managing our day-to-day -day cases to diagnose particularly on the uh, this new agent, which we are lacking knowledge, and that is a good waste time to us to update our knowledge. Uh, thank you very much again, on behalf of the organizers. Now, the, we are turning on the third presentation. Uh, our speaker is... Uh, Dr. Pabasiri Ginige is a consultant psychiatrist and a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine, University of Pradenia. She is going to talk us on real life scenario on depression. Uh, and Pabasiri, to you, to you. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I hope everyone, everybody can uh, see my slide set. And yes, um, my two colleagues have, um, my first colleague, Thilini, has touched upon most of the scientific aspects of depression. And um, let me uh, share my experiences over years on some real life scenarios of depression. Oh, I will give you Paparna, very briefly, she's a 30-year-old single executive at a private company from Malabe. And she presented to me a few weeks ago, uh, feeling extremely low, tired, and feeling useless for the past um, two, uh, for past six months. She questioned her self-value. She felt miserable and tired. She was finding it very difficult to work. She could not concentrate on her studies. She was reading for her info and felt life is too much to bear. I often wondered why she was born in the first place. Now, when we went into details of her history, she went out, I found out that she has been going out with a guy, dating a guy for nearly three years and she had to stop the relationship because she found him very selfish, self-centered 
and not caring about her emotions and needs. I don't know how many females in the audience feel that way about the partner, but this is not a feminist talk, just be with me. So she claimed that she felt constantly worried when she was having the relationship. Mind you, she was constantly worried when she was having the relationship too. And actually they were going to get married and both families were very happy and approved of the relationship and they were very happy finally that she's getting settled at 30. And now everybody seems to blame her for stopping the relationship being called off before the wedding, right? So this is one case. And let me go to take you to, to another case where a little boy, Alok, of 10 years, he's from Kandy. And he came with this very interesting presentation. These are real life, life scenarios, I'm telling you, I'm, I have not got them, uh, you know, uh, formulated in my head. He came with a complaint, the family was complaining, this guy is setting fire to the house and like almost, you know, almost uh, the full house was like kind of burned down according to the family. Two adults, adult cousins were very angry and loud who accompanied the kid. And they were accusing him for the extreme bad behavior. They are hurry naughty, this guy is very naughty, the cousins were telling. The child was really anxious and he was almost pushed into the room and he was dead frightened, he was very frightened. It was clear that he believed that he was brought in for some punishment by me. Okay, let's go with him, we'll give you, you know, that kind of, that's one of the commonest ways the kids are being, particularly the naughty kids are being dragged to the doctors, particularly the psychiatrists. So he was, then I started talking to him. Slowly he opened up for me, to me. He was feeling very sad and angry for about seven to eight months. But unfortunately, he did not want to tell the mother and the father as in his own words, he said he didn't want to hurt them by telling how sad and miserable he was. He felt as if he was not loved and he was ill-treated. And when actually the parents actually did their best for him, they were not neglecting this kid, but he felt he was not loved and ill-treated. And he would get angry and he would get very, very angry episodically uh, in the context of this sad, miserable, low mood, he was getting very angry. And at that time, he get this urge to set fire to the house. And he would leave the house down, room by room. And if, and, and one at our cousin said, doctor, if he could not, you know, burn one room, um, he would somehow other sneak out, even in the night, get up and he would just, you know, light up that room as well, the final room. So he has been having this burning the house kind of behavior for a few, um, you know, maybe about one week. And all this time, the, house, the fire has been not that bad, but what precipitated them dragging the kid to a psychiatrist being, was that the, the fire was really large and once it went really out of control. And mother was suffering from depression, father was in debts due to losses in his business. And, uh, you know, what broke my heart was the kid said, sorry, in a very mute uh, smile um, voice, he said, I'm sorry, I, I was being very bad, please, I'm sorry. All right, maybe we'll go back to two cases time to time throughout my little talk. Now, this is how the depression features comes in textbooks. Now, DSM criteria, DSM-5 is our big Bible, the American one out of the two Bibles, we have kind of the diagnostic categories. Um, at least five of the symptoms should have been there. And one symptom should be diminished interest pleasure or depressed mood. Now depressed mood for children and adolescents, this can be 
not the sad or depressed mood, but an irritable mood. Now, diminished interest or loss of pleasure in almost all activities and hidden ya, we call it. So they have no pleasure at all. I mean, some of us, most of us so-called normal people, non-depressed people, we lose interest in sometimes in some things in life, but it, that is transient, it's not persistent. In depression, the depressed mood is persistent. In a child or an adolescent, it's the irritable mood, mostly more than the depressed mood. And the diminished interest or the loss of pleasure is also pervasive almost all the time, almost all the act uh, throughout activities. Having said that, clinically speaking, sometimes depressed people would light up a little bit, would try their best to be engaging and, uh, you know, happy, but that doesn't last long. It just goes back to uh, this depressed mood and diminished interest. And there could be weight changes and changes in appetite and sleep is disturbed either too much sleep or not enough sleep. And some of the depressed people could be agitated, psychomotor or retarded. And some could be having loss of energy. Now this loss of energy is or not enough, um, you know, feeling not feeling adequately energetic is a huge problem in depression and that's one of the commonest features no no energy in my body doctor to do anything and some feel very worthless and diminished ability to think or concentrate in decisiveness you know uh, particularly um, you remember in the case of aparna she had uh, this feeling of worthlessness self doubt what's the point of living kind of um, feelings. And she couldn't read for her infant. She, could, she said she couldn't concentrate, she can't pay attention. And very common, I think most of the medical fraternity knows that, you know, depressed people talk about death, recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan or even suicidal attempt or a specific plan for committing suicide. They are very much um, associated with depression. So these are the textbook uh, clinical features. And it is important that, as I said, most of us, in, in uh, when we run through our lives, we feel those symptoms, you know, if I ask you to zoom hands up, um, you know, raise your hand through zoom. If you have never felt, you know, this life is so tiring. I wish I can take a break, wish I'm better off death kind of feelings. We normal people get that. But then, you know, the, the, the symptoms should cause significant distress or impairment in functioning. That's a must for us to go and diagnose this clinical disorder of depression, okay? When we say depression, depression can be a clinical disorder and depression comes in as a symptom as well. In any illness, say diabetes, hypertension, this depressed mood can be there as a single symptom. But what we are talking about today is the, um, the clinical symptom disorder of depression where the neurobiological changes, the chemical changes in the brain, the neurocircuitry changes and the, you know, genetically determined uh, and psychosocially determined neurobiological biopsychosocial depressive disorder I'm talking about, okay? And so for us to diagnose the symptoms I have just described, should cause um, significant distress or impairment in functioning. The symptoms are, cannot be attributable to any other cause, like what my good friend and colleague said about drugs, the substances of abuse, 
uh, or a medication. You know, most of you all are physicians and uh, surgeons, and the yoga guys give medicine like antihypertensives, anti um, ischemic heart disease. Most of your medications causes depression in our patients. So this clinical disorder of depression could be due to those medications or any other psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia or mania or any other uh, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, any other thing. We are talking about the depression. Depressive disorders can be rated as mild, moderate, or severe. And mind you, the junior doctors and my uh, friends, mild depressions usually do not come to you and me. We brush past them in our corridors. We brush past them in the supermarkets, in the roads. Uh, it's usually the moderate or severe depressive people that come to us, the doctors. And the disorder can be complicated if depression is um, occurring with psychotic features. There are special psychotic features that these depressive people can have. And the mood, uh, we say those psychotic features could be usually mood congruent, but there are mood incongruent that is not matching uh, with the mood kind of symptoms, psychotic symptoms are also noted in depressive disorder. Now it's important for us to know everybody depressed, you know, you may go think, um, some of you may think at least, you know, depression means, you know, looking miserable, uh, vertical furrows and, you know, corners of the mouth downward. That's what the typical uh, textbook descriptions of the appearance and behavior of depression says. And most of our medical students, they talk about the appearance and behavior of the depressed people with those classic um, uh, physical features. Don't get misled. Depression can be uh, you know, presenting with different, different ways. And in males, my male colleagues and friends in the audience, males, you, if you get depressed, uh, you may come up with not low mood, but angry mood or irritable mood. And depressed males may be masking their depression by abusing substances of abuse. We usually say, you know, a male depression will be drowned in alcohol, which is very much seen in the clinical practice. And it's in the books too. And male depression can present to us with sexual problems, erectile dysfunction, you know, lack of sexual desire. And male, depressed males can be involved in extramarital relationships also. Not all the men who are involved in extramarital relationships are depressed. Don't go with that. Could be a very good excuse. And I'm saying, um, you know, people, when they are so miserable and low, they tend to, you know, have self-medication, some therapy. So substances are called cannabis, even heroin, that could drive some of the male depressions to those substances. And cognitive features of depression, forgetfulness, I can't concentrate. I find it very difficult to keep things in mind. Those are the symptoms. And females, um, they can present with textbook classic features, but these are some of the more or less similar to males. They also can get irritable but their anger usually leads to very physical violence and all that, unlike in the case of males, but they neglect self, they neglect household, the children are not fed, the female is not cooking proper meals for the family and not interested in sex and again, forgetfulness and uh, lack of concentration. And children, like other guy, our look, he's, he was brought because he was naughty. When you went and worked with him, it was found that he was having very miserable, low mood. He was suicidal. He has actually 
go onto his balcony and try to jump off the balcony several times because he thought he's such a bad boy. He can't help burning the house. And he was being yelled at and even beaten by some of the adults. And he was feeling sorry for the mother. And don't forget, Alok's mom was depressed, is depressed. So there's the genetic component in Alok's uh, uh, body, brain, when he was born to this world because there's a genetic predisposition and father losing the business in the field in corona and all those things so he has those psychosocial stressors and father loss is one major fact in alok's life maternal depression so those things act in our Alok being very depressed. So poor school's performance is one major presenting problem. Adolescents also uh, get into substance abuse and disobedience, defiance and reckless sexual behavior. Some adolescent girls, they, they move from boyfriend to boyfriend in, um, when they're depressed sometimes. That's, they are not being naughty, but they are being seeking some help, some, some love, some way to get out of they are miserable moods. And elderly people will be showing these features. And peripartum women, it's very a bit of a tough, uh, challenging area to diagnose depression in a peripartum woman because um, you know their pregnancy symptoms could be clashing with the depressive symptoms, you know, aches, pains, back pain, leg pain, heartburns, those could be the somatic problems will be a feature of depression. And um, elderly people, they will be sulky and withdrawn and they would say enough living, you know, I'm a burden to my children. And when um, senior citizens feel that way, it's natural for some of the senior citizens to feel that way, but we have to explore and see whether they, these are symptoms of depression. There are lots of myths about depression. It's all in your head. It's only brought on by a stressful event. No, there are people who has no problems whatsoever that they live an envious life to most of us, but they could be depressed. And it is developed only in low socioeconomic settings, wrong. It could develop in anybody, but yes, low socioeconomic prob setting problems can precipitate depression, not cause most of the time. And it's all in your head is a very common transcultural, trans country, trans setting um, myth by mostly non psychiatry uh, professionals, even, even in their, them. They think, you know, it's all in your head. You know, you try to get your act together and get out of it. It's not that easy. It's an illness, it's a disorder like diabetes mellitus is an illness, depression is also an illness, a depressive disorder I'm talking about. And most of the people think antidepressants are addictive. No, some of the antidepressants may give gives rise to discontinuation syndrome. However, they are not addictive. It is, and some think if you are strong enough, only weak-minded people get depressed. If you're strong enough, you know, you can beat the depression. I wish, I wish. It is brought by, on by thinking too much. You know, Doc, this guy is thinking too much. That's why he's depressed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're depressed, you may be thinking about every slightest problem in your life. And people think all depressed people look depressed. No, there is a condition called smiling depression. Now my final, in my last 30 seconds, I don't have a take home message. I have a take home questions from you. Have you come across, ladies and gentlemen, a person with depression? What have you done? Thank you. You have been a lovely Zoom audience. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Kabasari for that very interesting presentation and telling us about the seriousness of the situation and the different ways that the patient can present. And uh, now we'll be moving to the 
next presenter that's uh, professor rasnayaka mudial say who is uh, from uh, the university of pera the near professor in pediatrics and uh, he's interested about uh, childhood education and behaviors and uh, over to you dr mudial say uh, thank you indika thank you uh, slma and ksm both for giving me this opportunity i think i'll be starting from the point where uh, our tilini stopped in fact i like to uh, redefine my reword my topic in fact uh, rather than primary prevention of misbehaviors i'm talking about primordial prevention of misbehaviors i think i need to define what my topic is about when i say misbehaviors i'm talking about all these things are misbehaviors uh, any form of killing homicide or suicide harming disturbing humiliation harassing not being collaborative not sharing not being supportive not being proactive and participatory they are all misbehaviors they are not good behaviors for a productive society a, a peaceful society when i say primordial prevention is not just uh, putting them in prison or gallows or rehabilitation creating a safe environment not dis uh, not preventing by displaying consequences they are not primordial primordial prevention is more of wisdom of not harming inculcating the wisdom of social responsibility inculcating the capacity of empathy and sensitivity and uh, creating advocates and champions of peace and harmony so that's the type of uh, thinking that i have i will explain now we are talking about misbehaviors i have labeled them as misbehaviors homicide suicide uh, uh, abuse of any form rape ragging harassing robbery corruption all are, all are misbehaviors we don't like them and not only that uh, any form of disruptive non collaborative creating conflicts chaotic behaviors are not good so people should not be disrupting no conflicts no interaction peaceful life is that enough for a peaceful society is that enough for a progressive society so my argument is no we have to go beyond that we should be able to create people who are empathetic who are supportive who are collaborative and living yourself empathetic supportive and collaborative is not enough you should be promoting that in the society this type of behavior you should appreciate you should support and you should collaborate among others and then we should be champions and advocates of empathy peace harmony and collaboration so that is what is important so that's why uh, uh, albert einstein says the world will not be destroyed by those who are doing evil but by those who watch them without doing anything now if you look at these bad behaviors that i listed we try to prevent them by uh, punishments harsh punishments uh, i am not saying that they are useless but that alone is not sufficient at least let me say that and then uh, we having uh, police and cctv camera and sort of lectures telling them these are the rules and regulations may not be good enough and then even uh, trying to motivate them by rituals and things like that may not be enough and then whether you can prevent die by rewarding recognizing and you know uh, respecting good behaviors uh, positive approach that is an appreciative approach uh, that is maybe a good thing but then i believe that it's uh, is the mainly uh, it should be uh, we should try intrinsic motivation where uh, you create children right from the beginning uh, it's in the child rearing practices in the education system to develop them into a, a, a good citizens now our motivation is important the intrinsic motivation not that extrinsic motivation is not useful intrinsic motivation is very important it can be positive intrinsic motivation by reflective learning or it can be negative by giving uh, getting them to reflect on regretting and apprehension but extrinsic motivation reward and praising may be useful but punishment and criticism they are useful but what i'm trying to say is we need to uh, focus on more of intrinsic positive motivation 
Uh, now, uh, in any disease, you have tertiary prevention, reduce or limit the impairment or disabilities. Or you can think of secondary prevention, early diagnosis and treatment. But then this concept of primary prevention is health promotion and then prevent it among the population at risk. But primordial prevention is lifestyle modification by individual and mass education. I think the same principle could be applied for this uh, suicidal and misbehaviors in the society. That's why uh, Nelson Mandela says that education is the most powerful weapon which can use to change the world. Now, if you look at the definition, definition of health, now WHO earlier definition says that health is not merely absence of diseases, but also uh, physical, mental, psychosocial well-being. But this, uh, this definition has gone beyond that. Health is a lifelong process of progressing towards the best possible. It's a, it's a, it's a lifelong process of progressing. Physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, and environmental well-being. Now, that's important. Now, we need to think of our physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, as well as environmental well-being. It's not only as individuals, but also as a society, a member of the society. We, we need to progress our health, not only as a single individual, but also as a society, as a community. Therefore, it's important for us to think of the definition of education. Education is a process of changing of behaviors of a person effective. Now, we need to change the behavior. It's not a matter of remembering things. So therefore, you need to address all domains of learning, the knowledge, uh, psychomotor, affective, and interpersonal skills. So we are the, in the Bloom's taxonomy, you need to have the knowledge and you should sort of go to a level of applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And when you look at that, you feel that where this, uh, some people think that education is for the productivity, but then it goes beyond that. Education is for life. And there you need to think beyond this uh, uh, application of knowledge to be productive. And understanding yourself is important. I think Lord Buddha has said that, and the Socrates has said that, the Plato in his statements, he says that understanding yourself is an important step. And that is one of the important steps in the, in, the, uh, in the acquisition of knowledge and real education, where it's not only the factual knowledge that you need to go to a higher level of understanding, but also your conceptual knowledge, your procedural as well as metacognitive, where you, you know about yourself, you know about the knowledge, understanding about the knowledge and understanding about the self. And, and that is where I think when you define the education for life comes in. And that is what is important, where metacognitive learning, you identify self, relate to the society, enhance the capacity of interactions, deconstruct one's own biases, and reflect on own progress and innovate on life. So that is where you can change the society, you can change a person. I believe that changing a person is your wisdom that we need to address. Yeah, how good you are, your mindfulness, your empathy, self-actualization, all that comes in this prajna, this wisdom, the inner part of it. And based on that, you develop your attitudes, your self-advancement and your social benefits and the, the, your, your, your performance towards the benefit. And based on those two, you develop your competencies your communication, collaboration, and advocacy, managerial skills, so on and so forth. And, and from there only you get your outcomes to a specific task, your own occupation, social responsibility. So we need to address intrinsic motivation by looking at this metacognitive part of learning so that your, your behavior can be changed. And it's the same thing that is expressed in the 21st century. Uh, skills, you need to address competencies and character building. In fact, we have looked at the same thing in Canby. Uh, we add on this wisdom part into it. We believe that that is the uh, wisdom is the one that influences your character qualities and competencies 
and based on that only you have to learn your subject knowledge to achieve this the self learning is the most important thing you have to look after yourself and the same thing uh, socrates says i cannot teach anything to any uh, anything uh, anybody anything i can only make them think now this is very important because it's the metacognitive part of the learning that create the change in your person your life your soul education is a is is not a filling of a vessel but lighting of a flame again indicating that it has to be a a, a process of self learning the secret of education lies in the respecting students and then children must be taught how to think not what to think now this is very important now we should empower our children uh, to think now this is very well expressed by uh, uh, by our madhagama dhamma please he says that api pani vadaya hadala tamai pani puruwanna tone api pani vadaya hadannata kalin pani puruwanna hadana so that i think that's very important children must be taught how to think not what to think so therefore experiential learning is very important if you are really thinking of changing life so uh, as tilini mentioned it's not a matter of giving more knowledge for them to study but getting them to practice and getting them to think of what it is now most of the problems that we see in the society is lack of empathy karuna gune empathy is a non spontaneous intellectual advance a fruitful appraisal and understanding and altruistic altruistic cognitive behavior it's not a spontaneous emotional primitive effortless arousal feeling or egoistic affective behavior so that is important what we need to inculcate is the empathy and that can be done in the process of education empathy create feeling of understanding of separateness it does not create attachment it does not create closeness it's a learned behavior it's coming from the neocortex which is the advanced part of the brain that induces parasympathetic activities and thereby make somebody calm and it's inhibitory so therefore it's energy saving and it leads to professional satisfaction and burnout less like so it's not only for the professional but also in the society inculcating empathy is a vital thing in the society we must understand that child rearing practices create the world and we need to not only look at their nutrition and security and the sick uh, the health but also we need to create opportunities for early learning and then uh, responsive caregiving those two things are very vital in the process of their character building there are very many different types of parenting now there are parents who are supportive or they are may not be supportive at the same time they can be very demanding or undemanding depending on that you can classify parents into four types of parenting authoritarian parents where they are supportive as well as demanding that's supposed to be a better way of empowering your children and you can have authoritarian parents they are unsupportive but demanding and then you have permissive parents they are supportive and not demanding and there are rejecting and neglect type of parent uh, and they say definitely these parenting styles have impact on subsequent lifestyle subsequent behavior of these people they are different in their self image their emotions social skills and academic performance so therefore uh, uh, we need to train our parents how to look after their children parenting style is a important thing to consider and then uh, teach and train the society negative parenting can lead to anxiety and many bad behaviors among children and that will lead to bad adult behavior end up in various not so good things and death killing and harmful things in fact uh, we used to think of uh, uh, development of atherosclerosis that start from infancy 
dietetic habits, stressors, feeding, unhealthy meals, lifestyle, bad behavior, smoking, end up in atherosclerosis, cancer, death, diabetes, and deaths. I think the same thing is happening on the other side. Parental care, anxiety, stressors, lack of respect, restrictions, forced to th do things, harassments, criticisms, ragging, abuse, disruption, and, and they will be contributing to bad behaviors at the end. So therefore, I think it's very important for us to think of uh, 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 child rearing practices, early education as an important aspect of uh, suicide prevention. And I think I'll put all of them, all of them together, they are misbehaviors that I include ragging in the same 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 package and uh, that's a exhibition of bad behavior lack of empathy uh, in incapacity in building relationships in fact what i have done is i did not have any research evidence or any academic thing it's a intuitive thinking and the intuition my intuition is the one that i use in my presentation the intuitive mind is sick sacred gift and the rational mind is a, a faithful servant we have created a, a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Thank you. Professor Mudiyanse, congratulating a wonderful presentation. It will be, I think, helpful to all of us. I'm being a parents and the teachers and in all in the education of the graduates. And then I think that this will be enlightening all the teachers and everyone in the society. Congratulating again on behalf of the organizers. Now we have come to the end of all four presentation. Now we are present uh, session open for question and answer session. And uh, the, we got some questions from our listeners and uh, I'm inviting Professor Karuna Tilaga to direct the question. Uh, and then we will direct a question to each of you. Thank you. Uh Dr. Mathagether, and uh, thank you for all the presenters for very interesting and enlightening presentations. We have got a lot of questions from the chat and as messages also. Uh, most of them have been actually attended to and uh, replied by the speakers themselves. But maybe we can summarize some of them, and if the speakers need to add something, uh, then they can do so. One common question was during the COVID time period, was there an increase in the suicide rates? I have answered this question already, but maybe yes. briefly for everyone. We did look at this, at least not nationally yet, but we looked at it at Peradinia. And uh, during COVID, the hospital admissions for attempted self harm declined. But obviously, that also would have been influenced by other factors, such as you know the lockdown itself. People cannot get to hospital, and there may have been other factors that also minimize self harm, like unaware. Uh, they probably could access uh, substances, even medications. More people at home. So, uh, I think what will be interesting to see is what happens to self harm and suicide rates over the forthcoming months, when we see the you know, we might likely see the economic impact of COVID lockdowns and um, other stresses coming. And that's something that we will, we are hoping to look at over the future months. And I may add Indica. Indica. Um, we see lots of anxiety and depression in children, adolescents, and even adults uh, in relation to COVID um, because the lockdown has a serious impact on mental health and uh, increasing uh, domestic violence that affects everybody in the household mm -hmm. and even substance abuse. So all those um, uh, behaviors um, have increased in uh, the past uh, uh, several months when I Sri Lanka I agree. Uh, yeah, we I got another I question agree. directed to Chaturi. Uh, it says that with regard to psychoactive substances, do you believe that the illegal uh, of makes them more appealing? And they are, is it, are there any possibility to absolute banning 
an appropriate regulation to control this uh, substance, uh, various psychiatric agents. Chaturi? Um Yes, I think uh, these uh, illegal substances, I mean, they should be controlled because otherwise, I mean, there is no question about it because if it is freely available, then that means free access to everybody. And also, uh, particularly the youth, the adolescents, because of their impassive, uh, impassivity, because of the novelty-seeking nature, they are going to try it out. And that is not only going to be like that it's not going to stop at that now what has happened to alcohol and other substances like you know it starts from the at the level of big matches and then uh, they sort of go on uh, abusing them and become independent and all the consequences so that's what is going to happen with all these substances as well because it's going to be really, really difficult uh, if it is going to be like, you know, something like if it falls into the same caliber of alcohol and so on, or cigarettes for that matter. And then just to add, I mean, uh, all these uh, substances like cannabis have been shown to be the gateway for other substances and uh, they'll become multiple uses. So, I mean, uh, there's a very strong public health reason as well for this, uh, because this is a starting point and the gateway and move into, into others. And due to these reasons, SLME has actually taken a very strong stance related to the cannabis and other substances. Yes, sir, exactly. Yeah, there is another question uh, it related to as to action for suicide among young girls, uh, is it possible if research team create a kind of risk analysis using score and mathematical format? I think Tilini, I think the director question to Tilini. Hey, I saw the, I was actually answering the author, the, the question, which is an interesting the question. The will benefit there, if you can tell some information. <laughs> to the interesting matter. question. We already uh, have, well, there are already many tools to predict suicide risk, particularly in people who have already attempted suicide or who have a psychiatric illness. And um, they are reasonably accurate, though there's always a degree of variability. None of them are 100% correct. Um, it is very difficult to predict self-harm behavior, I would imagine, in the community among, say, people who have never attempted, who have no psychiatric morbidity, then it would be a diff difficult thing to predict and have, I'm not even sure whether we could ever have, so whether such a mathematical formula is possible reliably, I'm not sure. Um, it's an interesting idea, but I would guess it would be very difficult to predict in somebody who's never attempted, who doesn't have a psychiatric illness, who's just a young person in the community. Um, yeah, yes sir, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But um, yeah. you I, can, you can yeah. I suppose I'm medically qualified. Now, my question to you is how can you get all this into the newspapers and into the public knowledge domain? Because lots of stuff you said is, is common sense. And I think most of the people in the country don't realize it. They, they know more about road accidents than what you said. So how can you use the newspapers, the press, the radio, use various tricks to get this kind of information out in public so that the public knowledge of it will have a beneficial effect on um, the illnesses themselves and the serious consequences? Social media. And social media, uh, I don't know, but anyway, there we are. Social I'm going to stop talking now. Professor Mudian, say you're able to answer. Well, I I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a matter of uh, we uh, pursuing on it and we trying hard. And uh, media do get we get attention from media, but that uh, may not be enough. And uh, worst thing is that uh, media is more interested in uh, getting uh, giving publicity to the material that is. Uh, commercially you know there is when there is commercial benefit uh, so that is the issue but the the problem is now say i mean if we if you look at our education system and if you sort of modify our education system we are addressing the entire nation uh, 
uh, without failure. I mean, that's, a, that's the most important thing. And unfortunately, our education system is not addressing the behavior change. Our education system totally, totally uh, relying on and trying to uh, get people to cram and create competition and hating others. So I think that is where we have a big problem. Uh, and, and definitely, yes, media should uh, play a role. Can you can you use the so I better shut up now, well, but uh, can you use the social media at all or do something? Because I think most uh, of what you have said. Can I can I keep in here, sir? Hi, sir. Baba here. Nice yes, Baba. I can see uh, Facebook is live streaming this at this very moment. Am I right, Indika and uh, Dr. Narakidra, Professor Indika? Yeah, this, yeah. Is we, we, this is uh, the live screen in the Facebook also. Yeah. I think, uh, I think yeah. the uh, yeah, very strong, sir. Social media is very strong. I think this message yeah. will go across to many, many communities. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. Social media probably it's a kind of double-edged sword. Like, I mean, at the moment, if you follow the social media discussion, it goes both ways. I mean, the one part, the amount of opinion related against uh, use substance abuse. On the other hand, there's a fair amount of justification and very strong lobbying for substances as well. So it's, it, it goes both ways. Sometimes it can be quite aggressive as well. Yeah, when this discussion is live streamed in the curve, when people watch this, then they can voice their concerns for or against, then maybe the admin page, so whoever who's responsible can answer if we have that kind of time and commitment, of course. Yeah, this actual live telecast oh. Facebook, actually, definitely then the, this message will come across the society. I think as an as a organization, like even Canadian Society of Medicine and SLMA, all these organizations and professionals, this is our I think, prime duty. To, to advocate the society on these various aspects where the, all of you deliver the wonderful presentation in the different aspects. Where finally, it is actually the, the based on the human behavior and the people act and how the people are directed to the suicide or depression, the misbehavior, or people who are going for a various psychoactive substances. I think that the society needs to be changed from the, from the preschool age to there and the home environment. I think I think the speed lecture, it gives us a lot of insight into that. And three of you has focused on the various aspects. I think that will be a very encouraging. And, and as as organization and SLM and our KSM, I think we have done our duties on this regard. And that is not be the only one event. We need to continue on this on, on continuous basis, including the ragging in the universities, as you know, Professor Mundi has correctly mentioned, all needs to be addressed in the proper way. And the school and the way of behavior and the teaching habits and the education system of this country are not on the correct, correct track. I think uh, we all are part of the responsibilities on us. Now, now at the, at the concluding of this uh, today webinar, uh, I think I, I, I must uh, uh, thanks all of you, and I'm inviting uh, Dr. Sam uh, Sumedha Samankam, the consultant respiratory physician and the Joint Secretary of Candy Society of Medicine, to conclude the session uh, officially. Thank you, uh, maybe before Dr. Sumedha comes in, on behalf of SLMA, I'd like to thank all the speakers and the Candy Society of Medicine. Uh, it was a pity that we couldn't be in the beautiful city of Candy today, but at the same time, it's an encouraging fact that we have decided to face this brave new world in this situation and uh, adapt ourselves. So it's also kind of a, an example that we can face this kind of situation and still thrive. So uh, thank you very much for all the speakers and presenters. Very good participation, very encouraging and very interactive as well. So I think we can move forward from this session and take heart from this the success and also follow up on the success of this program uh, for the future programs and the future activities. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Sumedhan. Uh, yes, sir. thank you, sir. So we have come to a very interesting two hours.
and as secretary of the KSF, I would like to thank everybody who's involved. So first, I'd like to thank our speakers today, uh, Professor Thilin Rajapaksha, Dr. Chaturi Suravira, uh, Dr. Pabasari Ginigi, and Professor Prasnaika Mudhiyanse for all your contributions. Thank you very much for the interesting, informative, and timely presentations. It was great to have you here. Uh, your time is much appreciated. Uh, and I would like to thank our two presidents, uh, President of the KSM, Dr. Dushanta Mandagadara, and President of the SLMA, Professor Indika Karunathilaka, for their support and also being our chairpersons today. And uh, it is really encouraging to see that we had a lot of participants today, uh, more than 150 in both the Facebook as well as the Zoom meeting. So it was very encouraging. And thank you all for your presence. And we would like to see you again in our future programs as well. Thank you. And uh, then I would like to thank the two councils of the KSM and the SLMA and my uh, fellow secretaries, Sajib and Sumitra, uh, for their hard work in uh, organizing this uh, regional meeting. Uh, also, I would like to thank Vihanga, our IT coordinator from SLMA, uh, for the smooth functioning of the meeting without any technical glitches. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here and all the support. Um, I think uh, we can conclude the session now. Uh, it was great to have you here. And have a pleasant evening, all of you. Thank you. <laughs>